Hey everyone, I'm John with Roadkill Incorporated. Welcome to the second episode of Retro Resale, my new series where I uh, justify my hoarding habit by making videos about it. Uh, this documents my biggest pickup ever, my biggest retro pickup ever. I still can't believe the extent of what I got in this pickup. There are still hundreds and hundreds of small items that I just haven't even come close to organizing and selling. Uh, there'll probably be more videos just on smaller chunks of the material that I got uh, from this pickup. So anyway, there's a lot to get to, so here we go. So as usual, I was compulsively searching eBay for common keywords like Commodore. I always sort by newly listed because you can see this stuff as it pops up, as it's listed. And lo and behold, this appeared. When I see a huge local pickup lot like this, I usually get frustrated because chances are it's not local and therefore not practical. But this one was actually in Chicago, my hometown, which is six hours away. And looking at it, I knew instantly it's worth five times what they're asking. I mean, just look at this crazy listing. Piles of 128s, 64s, dozens of disk drives, giant tubs of software and books. It just seemed endless. Clearly, there was a ton not even shown. The listing says most of it works and that all the monitors work. You can't count on that, of course. But I did my usual math, which is to conservatively compute the value of the most valuable items. Say 10 good Commodore monitors are easily $200 each times 10 is $2,000. So the vast majority of the value is already met by the monitors, and there's obviously way more than that. So when a listing is an absolute steal, time is definitely of the essence, and I made a $2,000 offer even before I read the whole thing, honestly, and I instantly regretted making an offer because when you make an offer, it's no longer in your control, and you're just left sitting there waiting and wondering. Sometimes it's actually worth overcoming the urge to get a better deal and just buy it right off. I decided to write the guy an email saying I'm a collector prepared to drive down there and pick it up, figuring that would win him over and let him know I'm serious. And sure enough, he wrote back, which was a massive relief. He countered at 2500 I really didn't want to mess around anymore, so I agreed. He changed the price, I bought it, and that's that. So the next thing in these situations is the transition from excitement to the overwhelming realization uh, that I was going to Chicago the next day. Not something I particularly wanted to do, but obviously for this lot, it's totally worth it. It's so funny, when I make a huge deal buying a thousand MacBooks or whatever, I often have an uneasy sense in the back of my head that I must be insane. Like, would a sane person do this? Probably not. But then I have to reflect on my last 15 years, which have been financially successful, and I have to realize that if I am insane, well, then I've made insanity work. <laughs> So I did the pickup. I don't like filming these things. I, I just don't feel comfortable pressuring people to be on video. I should probably get over that. Really nice guy though. He was wearing a Raid on Bungling Bay t-shirt, so apparently he's not completely over retro yet. Uh, there were literally 10 fancy cars of all types in the driveway, and he had to move a few of them so I could get my van in. He had his own business apparently, and he was taking customer phone calls as I loaded the van up. And um, I was dripping with sweat by the time I was loaded up. I was definitely drenched. The trip back was uneventful, fortunately. I dread long trips because I imagine something happening with the van or whatever and getting stuck. But so far, so good. All right, so it's a week later and I've been putting off unloading because it's going to be a challenge to find space for all of this. Uh, but I'm going to do it today. Here's the side view. Lots and lots of floppy disks, lots of saran wrapped floppy drives, and lots and lots of books. I've definitely got my reading cut out for me for the next several years. All right, got everything out of the van. That was a lot of work. So yeah, we have a lot of stuff here. A lot of stuff. It's overwhelming, honestly. So here are Commodore 128s, 10 of them, not in great shape, but that was to be expected. The listing kind of showed us that. There are various ones with interesting add-ons like Jiffy DOS, that kind of thing. Uh, fast loaders, things like that. Uh, 64Cs look pretty good. Those are supposedly working. VIC-20s, not pet key VIC-20s, but you know, 
Can't expect that all the time. Lots of books. I mean, just, just every book you could imagine. Well, that's software, packaged software. But uh, yeah, supposedly this book's worth like a hundred bucks because it's by Jim Butterfield, who's pretty famous in the 64 world. Just tons and tons of books. Nice Oki Data uh, printer there. This is interesting. This is called a ZTEC Lieutenant Colonel. It's a Commodore 64 hard drive. It's a five and a quarter inch hard drive. It doesn't have the connector, the cartridge connector that connects to the Commodore 64. So it's kind of half of a solution, but uh, still pretty cool. Got 11 monitors. We have 1702 with the, the, the cover on the front, which is, which is good. It's a couple 1802, 1902, a couple 1084s too. Some of them have stickers that say no video or whatever. So, you know, I, I don't expect all of these to work, but we'll be testing these definitely. So the story with this lot is that apparently there was like a user group, a Commodore user group in Arizona or something. As the, the group kind of fell apart and dwindled down, there was the main guy and everyone would just sort of donate their stuff back to the main guy. And so he just collected everyone's uh, material and then he just held on to it for 20 years. And then eventually a couple years ago, he decided to finally just let, let it go. So this is basically an entire users groups. So here we have files, lots and lots of files. The guy this came from was apparently just really organized. I mean, just sprite programs, star battle, print shop. We have one of these power connector deals down there. Lots of power cables, more software, more books. Some of the software in this style, Bard's Tale 3, Bard's Tale 1. Easy finance software. There's Geos here, like everything related to Geos. Joysticks, power bricks. Hopefully we have enough 128 power bricks. Um, cartri Commodore 64 cartridges, a lot that I've never seen. Several MIDI interfaces, modems. These are all like 300 baud modems, like 10 different varieties of 300 baud modems. More cables, more books, tape drives. It's pretty crazy. A dozen tape drives in there. Joysticks, new in the box. More files, Commodore parts, more cables, more joysticks, koala pad. <laughs> Some kind of Wi-Fi. It looks like an Atari joystick. I don't know if it's actually Atari. Yeah, it is. Interesting. Wonder what that's worth. Who the hell knows? VIC-20 cartridges. Somewhere in here, there's a CPM cartridge for Commodore 64, like in box. That's worth a couple hundred. And then over here, we have thousands of discs. I mean, thousands. The guy who I bought this from bundled like 20 packs for sale, 25 packs for sale, and then just stop selling them. But apparently he was selling these bundles for good money. Uh, more package software. These must be Amiga discs, probably. Give them the guys into Commodore, mostly. More floppies and more floppy drives. Apparently the guy who had these fixed them, and then when they were fixed, he put them in saran wrap because as we all know saran wrap keeps retro fresh so yeah so there are possibly a, a number of good drives here so i'm obviously not going to test and try to evaluate the value of everything here that would just be completely ridiculous so i think what i'm going to show you is that the main items the monitors the computers maybe some software maybe some notable components and, and items are worth way more than the 2,500 I paid. I think that's probably what I'll do. Okay, got everything in and I'm very happy. Um, I spent a lot of time making space uh, so that it wasn't a complete disaster uh, when I got everything in here, but here are the monitors looking good. Uh, the computers, obviously, put the files back there where they will stay until the end of time. Um, yeah, here's a chunk of a 64. I don't know what's up with this 128. It's got this, whoa, 
Runaway 128. This one has this latch over the, the ports. I guess maybe some parent was locking their kid out of playing video games. I, I don't know. Um, yeah, but I've got a known good 64, uh, not from the lot, hooked up to uh, the first of the 11 monitors, and it works great. It's beautiful, uh, so that's a good sign. Uh, using a third-party power brick because the ones that came with 64s tend to not be good. They have the voltage creep issue often, and they fry the computer eventually. Um, yeah, so I'm going to continue on with the monitors. Monitor 2 working. Monitor 3 working. Missing the door here, but hey, can't be picky. Number 4 working. All four 1702s working. Very good news. Fifth monitor working. This is a 1902 that was made for the Commodore 128. Has a special RGB input for the 128, and it's working. Number 6, an 1802 is working. Number seven, 1802 monitor is working. Missing the cover here and the power button seems a little finicky, but hey, whatever. Number eight, another 1802, it is working and it's got the door. Number nine, a 1084, uh, you can't really tell, but it's very dark. Uh, I thought it was dead at first, but um, yeah, I don't know. So this is sort of working, needs some adjustment. Number 10, a different model 1084 and it is working, which is, uh, especially great considering the sticker says it isn't. So never trust the sticker. Well, I guess the streak can't go on forever. This 1902 is dead. Zero power, no light. So, oh well. Last but not least, monitor 11, not working. Uh, these 1084s have so many inputs and buttons. Sometimes you just have them set wrong. So I wanted to check my sanity, brought in a known good Amiga and it still didn't work. So I guess in this case, the sticker was right. Yeah, but I really can't complain. These are all the working ones here, and then there's the sort of working one. Uh, but the working ones are unquestionably worth, you know, $1,600 at a minimum, 200 each. Uh, so if I paid 2,500 for the whole lot, and two thirds of it is paid back just with monitors, that's incredible. Okay, time to test the Commodore 128s, all 10 of them. All right, first 128, let's see what happens. Ah, wow, it worked, looks good. Ooh, some keys don't work. Okay, well. Number two, this one was open. I had to plug in the top case to the board here. So we see what happens. Okay, I figured out what's wrong. The board is not screwed down, so the power switch was not letting me push it all the way up. I forced it all the way up. The computer comes on, but I don't know. Something is causing a, a stuck key. But good news, at least we have a good board. Number three, more bad keys. I don't know how that happens. No light. Number four, not particularly uh, optimistic here. No light. Number five, more keys. Sticker says plain vanilla works fine. So let's hope the sticker knows. And I don't see any light. Number six, this one's in reasonably good shape. Wow, the switch is just so stiff. No light on this guy. Number seven, more bad keys. It's like someone threw them across the room. No light, stiff power. Wouldn't surprise me if some of these needed a minute or two to sort of wake up. The capacitors haven't received a charge in decades in some cases, I'm sure. Number eight. Power light. Ooh, that's interesting. Whoa. Wow, look at that. Oh my gosh. It's working. And oh, bad keys again. So. I'm thinking maybe they broke the keys off in order to like designate them bad, just so they remembered. And number nine, hopefully we can finish this out with a couple good ones. Oh, the screen registered. Oh, there we go. Look at that, we've got a good one. Okay, best for last. This is a really weird one. It has a button. It has a, I think a Jiffy DOS switch to turn it on or off. And then it has a hole where they didn't implement something. It says Jiffy DOS, Key DOS, and 64K video RAM. 
Turn it on. Ooh, lights. And wow, look at that. Huh. So there's KeyDOS. It tells you about KeyDOS, Jiffy DOS 601 and KeyDOS. Hold Alt key during reset to activate KeyDOS. Oh, lower case. Okay. Interesting. So five sort of working and five not working. Not the greatest scenario, especially because all the keyboards are pretty much bad. It would be nice to have some good keyboards and dead machines and swap them out. Okay, on to the 64 Cs. Hopefully we'll have better luck with these. The guy who bought them from said that they are generally working, so we'll see. Okay, first one. Power light. Oh, look at that, working. All right, number two. Light on. And it appears to be working. Three of five. Power light. And we are good. Four of five, power light, and we're good again. And five of five. Hmm, no power light. All right, on to the VIC-20s. Some VIC-20s have the regular uh, round connector that 64s do, and others have this uh, different one here and then a different style power switch. So let's start with this guy. Wow, this is hard to... It's very sticky. There's a light, and there we go. And VIC-20 number two, light, light but no video. So, so here is the 20 megabyte Lieutenant Colonel external hard drive for Commodore 64 that came with the lot. Faceplate's broken off there. This piece of paper was underneath the drive folded up. It's basically a SCSI hard drive. I don't have the connector that connects it to the computer. Funny thing is, I've actually already sold this. I'm gonna be shipping it out tomorrow. I recognize that it would be an easy item to just put out there, and I listed it for $9.99, and it sold for $700. But uh, yeah, it turns out it's way more collectible than I ever would have guessed. And you know, it just goes to show, when you buy a large lot of stuff, you never know. Sometimes they throw a little box of junk on top and that box of junk is worth half of the whole lot. So this is the Commodore 64 CPM cartridge. CPM is a predecessor to MS-DOS, mostly used for business software. Uh, this cartridge is interesting in that it has a Z80 processor inside the cartridge. So it uses the, the processor in the cartridge. Uh, you put in the disk, load star comma eight comma one, and this is what you get. You get CPM. Okay, so I still haven't sold a ton from this lot, but here are a few items that I did sell. Uh, sold a basic Commodore 64 system for 710 profit. It's always good to throw in extras uh, on a package. So besides the computer, monitor, and drive, I included joysticks, cartridges, random disks, and uh, a bunch of other stuff. And of course, I guaranteed it for 30 days, and that strategy paid off. I sold the worst of the five Commodore 128s for 406 profit, which isn't great, but they weren't in great shape. I have so many 128s that it was worth it to dump the truly messed up ones. Turns out the Jim Butterfield machine language book was in fact worth $100, and I got 88 profit. Um, I would love to have kept it, but clearly someone else was going to appreciate it more. I don't even do programming. Uh, plus, I still have 200 books from the lot left. The CPM cartridge got me 191 profit, being complete in the box and all. The Lieutenant Colonel hard drive, as I mentioned, sold for 700 and got me 613 profit. That still blows me away, given it's just a SCSI hard drive in a box. I've since learned that the drive came with proprietary software and a file management system. So although I sold this as is and didn't test it, the buyer was probably betting on being able to recover that software. Hopefully it worked out. And the Oki data got me 214 profit. I was surprised by that one, but apparently car dealers and other businesses still use these for multi-form carbon copy printouts. Beyond that, I sold a couple monitors locally for 200 each, so that's 400. And I probably sold a few other items, but this is the brunt of it. Okay, so clearly I'm in the green already. This short list of items that I've skimmed off the top of this massive lot got me 2622 and I paid 2500 so I'm already doing great. 
And uh, conservative analysis of just a handful more of what's left shows I've got several times the value remaining. This is important. I always massively underestimate the value of everything. That way, if the numbers work, you know reality is actually way better. For example, eight monitors left at $200 each is $1,600. Uh, there are about 10 working computers left. They're worth more than 100, but let's just say 100 is $1,000. 20 working disk drives. I have dozens and dozens of disk drives. Uh, there are definitely 20 that are working. 50 is an underestimation, but hey, let's say 50, so that's $1,000 and 50 25 packs of discs could easily get twenty dollars each for those probably have 150 25 packs honestly but hey let's underestimate let's say 50 and that's a thousand dollars so right here we have uh forty six hundred dollars uh twice the value of the lot again and this isn't even counting the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of I'd say 20 to $50 items that I still have. So there's probably another five to $7,000 in this lot that just require a little bit of labor. So that's it. There you have it. The biggest retro pickup ever. I guess I should just stop at episode two because it's already gotten as good as it's going to get, right? Uh, just, just kidding. There's definitely a lot more. The thing with retro is there's always more. Anyway, thanks for watching. If you liked the video, please like, subscribe, share, tell a friend, whatever. I'm not the type to usually ask for help, but I'm trying to get this series off the ground and it's been a slow start, so anything helps. Thanks again.